Well, what a lovely book. And um, I've read, tried to read a couple of your dad's books. Um, this one I found a lot easier, which is the general idea, isn't I think, it? I think it says a nine plus average yeah, reading, age, reading age. I just about got there. Uh, it's much thicker than most of your dad's books, but it's a, it's, it's a right riveting read. And it's brilliantly um, divvied up into different sections. Mm. Uh, your introduction here, as throughout my life, I had the extraordinary privilege of spending time with talking to and asking questions of some of the world's greatest and most innovative scientists who were the friends and colleagues of my dad and my dad as well, Stephen Hawking, of course. I got answers from people who knew what they were talking about, about the baffling and thought-provoking uh, things that made me angry and sometimes cry. Listening to the answers or asking yet more questions made me feel as though I could reach out and touch the magnificence of the universe. Um, like how, for example, how did it how how did you feel? Like that? How come you felt like that? Well, because my father could explain um, how we could understand enormous, great, distant, cosmic, violent events happening way over the other side of space, but how we could understand them from Earth. And that's really what, what this book is about. It's called Unlocking the Universe, because it's about the different ways that humans have used to increase our understanding of the universe, how we've travelled around the universe, how we've used astronomy, radio astronomy, space travel, robotic space travel and theoretical physics to unlock the secrets of the universe. And that was the sort of basis of really all those questions, all the questions that kids ask, like, is there anybody out there? Um, <laughs> can, I, can I go to Mars? What would it be like if I was on the moon? Um, so it's a kind of combination of questions from kids answered by really kind of distinguished, leading, interesting scientists. OK, and it's brilliant because the more you know about something, the simpler, the more simply you can explain it, can't you? Well, well, they've done an amazing job. I mean, there's a huge diversity of scientific voices throughout this book, which comes from people that I knew through my father or um, as I started doing the children's books, which all the essays come from the six book children's series. So I would start going to a lot of science festivals, um, listening to science, going to science lectures. And I developed this habit of kind of hiding in the wings to leap out at someone who'd just <laughs> given a lecture and say, that was amazing. Now can you write it all again for kids? Yeah. Um, and to their credit, they all did. They, they have all done took it. the and challenge. It's, and it's, oh, amazing. I think it's a lovely book for kids to read, you know, for the 10 or 15 minutes before they go to sleep at night, because mm. it fills them with yeah. wonder, no fear whatsoever. Yeah. Yeah. And it's quite magical. What, what, are, what are the things that kids ask the most and present the most interesting answers? Well, of course, the famous question is, what would happen to me if I fell in a black hole? Yeah. And that's the question my dad was asked, and that was what inspired the whole this whole project, this whole seven-book project series, was inspired by a question from a nine-year-old boy. So if you are um, a kid and you have a question to ask an adult, ask it, because you never know what might happen. <laughs> you know, Incredible things could come as a result. Um, so it seems to be black hole, space travel and aliens and what's are the, the main... What's the planet you most get asked about? Is it Mars? Well, I always, if funnily enough, I norm it's normally the other way around. I normally like to talk to kids and say, which planet are you most interested in? Um, and a lot of them are very interested in Mars because there's the realistic possibility of going there. But people always like the exotic ones, you know, like Saturn and Uranus. <laughs> and, 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 and everyone feels sorry for Pluto because it's not a planet. Hey, so some people get the sympathy vote. Downgraded. 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 Downgraded, I know. Outrageous. I mean, Outrageous. Saturn's the coolest looking. You know, if you had to look like a planet, you want to look like Saturn, wouldn't you? But Jupiter, no, no. no. Oh, the You're rings, gonna, the, the rings, baby. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Come but on, that, well, it's so you know, cool. You don't want all the swirling tiger stripes and the clouds of. Well, you could marry. You could marry Jupiter <laughs> if you were Saturn. I mean, what a wedding that would be, oh, wouldn't it? That's a weird concept. Come on. I mean, would that work as a marriage? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm struggling with that one. I, I, I want to say yes. From a quantum but, um... physics point of view? <laughs> All right, I'll let you have it. Europa. Just OK, let's talk about Europa. So, um, you know, uh, in, in nine days' time, we leave the European Union, but we could all join Europa, couldn't yeah, we? Yeah, we could. We could all head off to Europa, which has, you know, a thick icy crust, and um, possibly some scientists think that maybe swimming around under that crust are uh, sort of alien extraterrestrials. So that actually means space dolphins, if you think about it. Um, and if there were space dolphins, you know, one of my scientists actually says in the book, the very eminent Lord Rees says there could be space dolphins. And why would they want us to know they were there? Perhaps they are perfectly happy just swimming around what in the ocean. Th what do you think? What do I think yeah. about aliens? No, what just what? Yeah, what do you think about all that? If you do, you, do you have a theory yourself? Do you have a thought about it all? Well, I think that the universe um, is so unimaginably immense i mean it's so huge and we now know that there are so many <clears throat> excuse me planets in orbits around stars other than our sun and so it seems likely that at least some of those planets will be in the habitable habitable zone from their star and so they could have liquid water on the surface they could very well have the conditions for life 
So I think, personally, I think it's unlikely that we are actually alone in the universe. Whether we actually make contact with an alien super race or otherwise is really another question. And then, of course, we may also find simple life. We may find sort of non-intelligent life Welcome forms. to the Virgin Radio Breakfast <laughs> It's here. Can I just say something to you about our climate change essay? Sure you I'm can, particularly yeah. proud of this. Yep. So this is written by a young writer. Um, Nitya was 15 when she wrote this essay. And we thought it was particularly important to have this topic addressed by somebody who was a teenager yeah. who could really write about how it seems to them. So it wasn't just kind of older people telling younger people about climate change, but it was actually somebody from that generation saying, this is what it means to me. But, but um, you know, what do, what have you gleaned from the brilliant brains that you have access to as what we might be able to do about it? Because realistically, the tide is just not going to turn. Well, that's very... Um, I, I, it is a very um, negative outlook at the moment. And you have a lot of people saying, I think Prince Charles is going to be saying at Davos today, have we already passed the point yeah. of no return? And um, we have Greta Thunberg saying, you know, we only have eight years. But I... Um, Obviously, I meet these amazing people. I see the way they work and their dedication and their brilliance and the um, extraordinary nature of the technology that these people are able to dream up and to implement. Um, and I have endless faith in the ingenuity of human beings. I do think we will solve it. But I do, as I said before, I think we just we need to be a bit more unified. We probably need to make changes to our lifestyles. But isn't it the ingenuity of human beings that's brought all this mess about in the first place? That's the unfortunate thing. Yes, it does seem to be our greatest gift and our worst enemy. So um, I think there will need to be some definite shift um, but this younger generation, as I said, are very committed, they're very passionate, they're very dedicated, they're very knowledgeable and they're prepared to you know, go out on the streets and strike and talk about it and write about it um, and really, really sort of make a noise about what they believe in. So not that's... Enough, it's not enough though, is it? It's not enough. I mean, there's a big story today in the papers that China are going to ban plastic bags by 2025. So what? Mm. I, I, I don't actually agree with you there. I was in China on a book tour this summer and I did, I have to say, I did notice quite a lot of plastic. So I was actually quite pleased when I heard oh, that no, story. No, no, don't get me wrong. It's it's definitely one of the right things to do, yeah. but it's like, you know, it's like you, 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 I don't know, a juggernaut's just driven into your living room and you start to get your dustpan and brush out. It's that kind of, that's what I'm, isn't, isn't there Too a, late. Hasn't there, to, isn't there a big idea that has to happen? Yeah, I would, I what, would agree. Any and idea where that might come from? Well, it's got to be in um, reducing our dependence fast on fossil fuels right. and stopping us from pumping all this CO2 out into the atmosphere in order to warm it, which is having these knock-on effects. It's um, I mean, you're, there's an essay in the book about uh, the oceans of the Earth and about how they've uh, weathering acts as a thermostat on the Earth's temperature, but that doesn't. It only works over long, long um, time frames, and it can't react really quickly. You know, it can't react to what's happened over the past 20, 10, 20, five years, and so I think that has to be um, one of our major, major focuses. Did your dad have a take on all this? Oh, he started talking about climate change a long time ago. I think he met Al Gore in the late 90s, and he sort of picked up on climate change, so he was quite a sort of early advocate of uh, the need for people to wake up and take action on climate change, and at one point people certainly sort of started to think he was being quite apocalyptic and saying, oh, it's Stephen Hawking predicting the end of the world again. Yeah, yeah. He's like the kind of 21st century Nostradamus, but honestly, when you look at things now, you have to say you know he had a definitely had a point and did he have any idea of a solution uh, he personally didn't um have a solution other than what i've said that a need for societal change reduce our reliance on fossil fuels find new sources of energy um look keep on this search through science and technology to find innovative solutions to the complex problems that we have the chris evans breakfast show with sky